Hi everyone, today I'd like to do another introductory video to organocatalysis, specifically on some of the early work by Professor David Macmillan at Princeton University that contributed to his winning of the Nobel Prize in 2021. If you find the video useful, please do give it a like and consider subscribing to my channel. That really helps me plan my future videos. So to understand the underlying principles to this work, I'm just going to start with a refresher of some of the control elements that are relevant for Diels older reactions and then we can see where the organocatalysis comes in. So a diels alder reaction is a pericyclic process, such as this example, where I have a diene and a dienophile. And when we heat these things up, we get a reaction where all the arrows go round in a ring like this. There's a four plus two cyclo addition to form cyclohexene. So what we're doing here is we're sacrificing some pi bonds for some new sigma bonds here and here. That's the driving force for this type of reaction. However, things aren't quite that simple. We can notice that the product is also an alkene, so in the context of a cyclo addition, also a dienophile. So unless we do something, it's going to be pretty tricky to stop this reacting further, for example, forming a product like this, and then polymerizing onwards. Bit of a nightmare. Another control problem is that, well, although we've got a diene, there's nothing to stop it reacting with another molecule of itself like this. Again, the arrow is just round in a ring, and forming a product with two dienophiles in it. And then these can keep on reacting as well. So we could get all sorts of mess of products in here. And that's why whenever we plan these reactions, we need to think about what we use as a dienophile for certain. Now we can have a think about the pi molecular orbitals here to help us out. For the diene, we'll have four pi molecular orbitals, two bonding type, one more so than the other, and two antibonding ones, one more so than the other again. It'll have four pi electrons, so we'll fill up these bottom two. The fully bonded one at the bottom has no nodes, and this next one up just has one node. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of pericyclic reactions in this video, but I will make a video on that topic in the future. The dienophile, this is just a carbon-carbon double bond, for example. So we'll have two molecular orbitals, something like this, one bonding, one antibonding, and we just fill up the bonding one with pi electrons. And the dienophile only has two. So in our reaction mechanism, we're mixing these two orbitals. There are some symmetry constraints on this, which can be explained using the Woodward-Hoffman rules. But just on a simple level here, we can see that we need to match some orbital energies. That's our model for reactivity. So for example, the highest occupied molecular orbital for the diene, which is here, will need to match up with the lowest unoccupied orbital of the dienophile up here. Alternatively, we could consider it the other way, just with these stars in green, and try to match these two. Now they're quite far apart as they are. That goes some way to explain why you need to heat this a lot, because there'll be a large activation energy barrier. So the trick that we play is that we make sure we have an electron withdrawing group on our dienophile, like this. This is commonly a carbonyl group, maybe like this ester. And what this does is lower the LUMO of the dienophile so that it's a better match for the highest occupied molecular orbital of the diene. So this means that any reaction will be faster using the dienophile with an electron withdrawing group. So that means once we've done one cyclo addition, we get no further reaction. I can just illustrate that with my ester here. If I treated this with butadiene and heated it up, I would get the cyclo addition product, the cyclohexene ring with the electron withdrawing group in this position. And we note that although the cyclohexene product has another carbon-carbon double bond in it, there's no electron withdrawing group conjugated to it. So we should keep getting reaction of our starting materials until they're all used up. Now that's all well and good, having a conjugated electron withdrawing group attached to the dienophile, but we can go further than that. We could use a Lewis acid to catalyze this. So even with our lowered LUMO, if we treated this ester with a Lewis acid, in equilibrium, I'd form a coordinated species such as this. And here the LUMO is lowered even further, so that means that the reaction will be faster with the coordinated species than the uncoordinated species. And we can probably get away with doing the cyclo addition at a lower temperature as well. Now I have another video touching on concepts like this, which I'll link in the description below. That's on the CBS reduction. But scientists realised we could go one step further than this and put in a chiral Lewis acid. I'm just going to represent that with a little star. So this is chiral, because that now means that the Lewis acid complex is now also chiral. And so that pre-coordination makes a dienophile chiral as well. This is the key to getting a nantio selectivity in a Diels alder reaction. So in the past, people worked out lots of things that we could do here. We could use transition metals with chiral ligands or P-block elements as part of chiral molecules, for example, using a boron center. But the breakthrough here came by identifying that you didn't have to use just the Lewis acid directly. We could use a small molecule to lower the LUMO of a system like this. So specifically, say if I had this aldehyde, this is acrolein, and I treated it with a secondary amine, such as pyrrolidine, 
we can generate an aminium ion like this. Now this is also an activated species, this also has its LUMO lowered, and because we're bolting on so many atoms here, and they're quite close to the carbon-carbon double bond, we can bring in some chiral information from another molecule and put it right jammed into the transition state for any cycloaddition. This leads to high levels of enantioselectivity. We also only need the pyrrolidine there in a catalytic amount, because the dienophile with the aminium ion is way more reactive, because the cycloaddition with a dienophile that has the aminium ion on it will be much faster. This then organic molecule catalyzed reaction can also be made an antioselective, hence asymmetric organocatalysis. So the breakthroughs by Macmillan and this research group was to design a catalyst using a molecule that's readily available in one enantiomer from nature, such as any old amino acid, and lots of progress was made by manipulating this structure here, this is phenylalanine. In the first generation of these catalysts, the carboxylic acid was turned into the amide, and then the two nitrogens were tied together using acetone, condensing to form an acetal-like structure here. So these are both methyl groups. Now note here, we've got that pyrrolidine ring system. We've got a nitrogen lone pair that's available for nucleophilic attack. The other lone pair up here in purple will be delocalized as part of an amide. But right next to that nitrogen, we've got a stereocenter. So I'm just going to draw that in explicitly with the hydrogen as well. So the hydrogen is coming down. Now to demonstrate how this works in a diels older reaction, I'm just going to use an example. I'm going to start with an aldehyde. This one here is cinnamaldehyde, a compound that unsurprisingly smells of cinnamon. But the reason why I'm using this as an example is that there are no enolyzable protons. Now, having enolyzable protons in this reaction can be a bit of a pain because that gives you an opportunity to form an enamine instead of exclusively an aminium ion. So it's something you'll have to watch out for if you're planning this chemistry yourself. I'm just going to rotate the catalyst around a little bit to emphasize the pyrrolidine ring. I'll also just note that this hydrogen here that's on the amide, just to help with the practical synthesis, you often see this functionalized with a methyl group instead. We can just put that on when we made the amide. It prevents any extra side reactions going on as well, and probably helps with organic solubility. So the catalyst structure is a pyrrolidine ring. We've got the amide at the top. There's the two methyl groups that have come from acetone down here. And on the left-hand side, I have a benzyl group pointing up and a hydrogen pointing down. So we only need to use a catalytic amount here. Now, one criticism of these reactions is that catalyst loading often needs to be a little bit on the high side from like 10 mole percent to 20 mole percent. But nonetheless, even if there is quite a low turnover number, the benefit you get from the high enantioselectivity often outweigh that, let alone the greener credentials of this reaction, where we don't have to use any metals, and we're just using small non-toxic molecules readily available in nature. Now this will react with my cinnamaldehyde to form the aminium ion, and actually it forms in this very specific conformation that I'm drawing now. You've got those two methyl groups being quite bulky. There's a nitrogen at the back. It's the amide. There's a benzyl group at the front. And what I've drawn here is actually the lowest energy conformation. Just to focus in on some bits here to show some of the steric interactions. We've got these two methyl groups here. This right hand side is quite bulky. So when there's a choice, we prefer to put the hydrogen on the aldehyde here versus the CH group on the other side. So that's a steric interaction. Having a look at that CH bond itself, that's just this one in green. Well, the conformation I've drawn here is actually the one that minimizes one free allylic strain. If I look at those bonds I've drawn in green, I'm using the Hauk model here. We can see that that CH bond, that hydrogen, eclipses the double bond. So that tells us specifically why that hydrogen likes to be in that position, as opposed to the alternative where we could have rotated around here and put all of this group there instead. So the lowest energy conformation puts the phenyl group further away, and that's the best option for this hydrogen. And the rest of this structure is just fixed by the fact that we had an e-geometry double bond anyway, so we can't control anything more. I'll just draw the final hydrogen in because it might be useful for us to keep track of. So although this molecule is largely planar, there is a key difference this time. We have this benzyl group on the top face versus a hydrogen on the bottom face. The benzyl group is much bigger than the hydrogen, so this means that the top and bottom faces of this molecule are sterically hindered in different ways, the top face being more hindered than the bottom face. So I'm going to try and see how we can draw this in a diels older reaction with some sort of 3D type transition state. So I'm just going to pick a diene to react this with. I'll just use beta diene for the time being. And we'll see what effect that that benzyl group has on the reaction. 
So just having a look at what the transition state looks like, here is my cinnamaldehyde in blue, and the catalyst structure has a pyrrolidine ring system, and this is all in the plane. Now my diene needs to find the dienophile, and while I don't have any of the other groups on this system, it will equally well react from the top or the bottom face. So for example, reacting on the top face, just guiding myself with these red lines, we would prefer to orientate the diene like this. This is the endo transition state. That's because the lowest energy transition state has an additional secondary orbital stabilization in a pi stack between the electron deficient pi system and the electron rich pi system, just indicated in green here. So that explains why the diene prefers to sit that way. Equally well, I could react with the diene on the bottom face, indicated just in green. And again, the lower energy transition state is the one where the diene is endo, where the diene is tucked in underneath the electron deficient aminium ion. So as drawn here, we'll just expect a 50-50 mixture of the two products coming from the red transition state and coming from the green transition state, just equally likely. Now, when we use our chiral catalyst, this top transition state becomes much less favorable. So just building in the catalyst at the back here, so two methyl groups, so amide at the back. And this preference is partly due to the fact that the steric bulk of this phenyl group versus the hydrogen, but also it's thought that this extra CH2 here gives this phenyl group just enough reach to stack over the top and sit on top of the electron deficient dienophile. So again, this is another pi stacking interaction. So now the top face of the dienophile is very blocked. This means that there's only really one transition state that the reaction can pass through, and that's this endo transition state at the bottom, and we get that product. So to follow through, the diene smashes up from the bottom face. So that's those atoms just drawn in green here. Just drawing a sort of sawhorse projection, the phenyl group and the hydrogen will be like this. And then at the back, well, the hydrogen is also going to get pushed up. And this is where our aminium ion catalyst will be. And we can see that we've set two new stereo centers there. But because this aminium ion is just forming an equilibrium with the aldehyde anyway, there'll still be some water kicking around and we can just hydrolyze off this. And this will end up as the aldehyde again. And then we have our product. So now we can just draw this in a flat representation. I'll keep the double bond in green just to keep track. So the two stereo centers are these ones here with red stars. As we can see in the sawhorse projection, where the aldehyde ends up will be on top of the hydrogen. So we know that this one is coming forwards. And we know the hydrogens are trans to each other, so this phenyl group will be going down. So we isolate this product in excellent EE and also in DR for this 1-2 antidiastereomer. Now I should note that this molecule can be used in other reactions other than cycloadditions, but this is also useful as just a general asymmetric electrophile in organocatalysis. And it's possible to get high yeast when you want to do an asymmetric Michael addition of, say, a soft nucleophile. Similar idea, you can do friedel crafts chemistry here as well, where aromatic systems are sometimes able to attack these selectively. You'll end up with a new stereocenter in high EE in both of these circumstances. And people have explored lots of other asymmetric transformations using structures like this over the last 20 years. If you found this discussion useful, please do give the video a like and subscribe to my channel. That would be muchly appreciated. I've just put on the screen now a few other videos of mine that deal with asymmetric catalysis, but I also have some other organic chemistry content that might be of interest to you. So please do have a browse around.